Two comments, Ahmed. Uh, do you think that uh, this is a job of a sonographer or a radiographer, or it's a job of the gynecologist who should do that? No, I think it's a, it's a role of a gynecologist, not a radiologist or a sonographer. I will tell you why. Because in some uh, health systems, the gynecologists are not, for example, trained to do transvaginal ultrasound or endometriosis, and maybe the, they they prefer referring the patient to a, a radiologist rather than doing the ultrasound by themselves. I totally agree with you because it's not just the diagnosis and uh, the ultrasound scan. I am I am not a, I cannot call myself a sonographer, but I learned I've been privileged to work in the place where you received your training in Italy for some years, and I learned from them. And it helps tremendously for planning the surgery and understanding and uh, and uh, uh, also counseling the patient on what she has correctly, as you said. So <clears throat> from the colleagues attending, and I can see there is a big number of, uh, of colleagues, that's very uh, rewarding. Thank you very much. And uh, any other questions from the colleagues? I can see that Mohammed Badi has a question for you. Uh, Ahmed, thank you for a very nice presentation, and comprehensive presentation. Uh, I, I ask you about uh, uh, if you have an infertile case with a suspicion of deep pelvic endometriosis, uh, when you make a decision for conservative management for this case, uh, by ultrasound, and when you prefer to go for surgery or you go for laparoscopy in order to further diagnose if there is any uh, further management before going for IVF or any uh, any infertility management. Okay, so uh, firstly, the, we uh, are actually guided with the patient's complaint and not by the ultrasound findings. The ultrasound is a diagnostic tool, but it's used to, uh, uh, it's a tool to uh, help us in taking a decision in the patient's management. The management's actually individualized according to the patient's age, the patient's fertility wishes, the uh, previous uh, deliveries, if she's having uh, any children before, and if she's seeking fertility or not. So some patients uh, actually, uh, 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 come to our, uh, our uh, unit uh, in the university hospital and they are seeking mainly fertility and they are not complaining, uh, the, the pain is not bothering them that much, although they may have some uh, uh, significant sonographic uh, findings, for example, large rectal nodules and uh, uh, large endometriomas, but they are not uh, in pain. So these patients, we counsel them and we encourage them to at least go for IVF and to freeze uh, uh, several embryos. And once uh, they uh, change their mind or the pain increased or something like that, they may can they can go for surgery. So the ultrasound is not the the, the main tool to guide us either to go for surgery or to go for IVF. We respect the patient's wishes and we uh, individualize the treatment or we tailor the treatment according to uh, individual uh, wishes of the patient. Perfect, Ahmed. This is music to my ears, actually, what you're saying. Thank you. And Dr. Gibril, uh, we have a question from Benjamin, uh, uh, who is asking about uh, if it's possible to get the link. Yes, I think uh, Darin and uh, uh, the IT team will provide you with the link, I think. Darin, are you providing the colleagues yes. with the link for yeah right perfect? Now I'm going to provide it with a link. <clears throat> so and also the uh, there is a question from Shafa Muta about the uh, endometriosis spots um, Ahmed are they hypoechoic or hyperechoic? And is it diffuse or you can measure the dimensions? I think I think maybe the question is about adenomyosis, maybe. But yes, you, you please, you, you, what do you think? According to the adenomyosis. So the question is endometriosis is spot. Is it hypoechoic or hyperechoic? So apparently this is not the lesion or the plaque or the nodule, etc., etc. This is about adenomyosis, if I'm understanding well from Shafa. 
So please, you 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 explain. So I think that I know the... about the lesion spot. No, no, she. This is not the adenomyosis. So I I, I misunderstood. I'm I'm sorry. It's about the lesion spot. So uh, endometrial yeah. lesions, deep endo lesions. Hyperechoic or Generally, it's, uh, it's a hypoechoic lesion uh, sure. compared to the surrounding uh, normal anatomical structures. And is it something that you can measure? Yes, of course. You can measure it uh, in all three dimensions. Any, any lesion in the pelvis can be measured, uh, especially the, the, the endometriotic nodules. Yes, it, it can be measured clearly by ultrasound. And I would highlight and uh, uh, make it very, very clear that the um, three dimensions is extremely important because craniocaudal and uh, anteroposterior or depth of infiltration are important, but more important than both is the lateral lateral extension because this indicates also the parameter involvement, which in posterior deep endometriosis is something that makes a big difference in the surgery, if that makes sense. Uh, Tamer uh, Hosni is raising his uh, virtual hand, so please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mabruk. I just want to uh, just highlight the, the comment of the colleague about the isochoic or hypochoic uh, picture. But actually, I have uh, a question. Uh, what is the dangerous sign during the ultrasound scan? Uh, if it's present uh, to uh, say that this patient is urgently um, should do uh, intervention, even the pain is not uh, so much. So what is the dangerous sign to see? Uh, just to highlight for the colleagues, or um, I'm just coaching also for Ahmed. Yes, Ahmed, please. <clears throat> okay, I, I think that uh, uh, we uh, 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 tackled this point before that uh, if a patient's complaining of um, it's not it's, the patient's not having significant pain, but for example, having significant hydroureter and hydronephrosis, and uh, because of endometriotic lesion, I think the, this patient would be uh, a, can, a, a good candidate for surgery, even if she's not having uh, significant symptoms. To I think this would be a, save, uh, a saving procedure for the kidneys and the kidney function. So, as, to my, as to my knowledge, uh, I don't know if there's any other, other thing that can be added for this question. May I just add a small comment, Ahmed? Yeah, yes, sure. So here we, we, we are dealing with a pathology, and as Ahmed has said, it's not the pathology, it's not the ultrasound. There are too many factors that would uh, help us to, um, to guide the decision-making and help the patient to make an informed choice. This is point number one. Point number two, sometimes you take this decision-making process to one side or the other according to your experience and expertise and what you see and how you would like to help this patient. So example number one, uh, ultrasound uh, uh, endometriosis is um, avascular. So on power Doppler, for example, you don't see hypervascularity in the, in the endometriosis, ovarian or non-ovarian. You do an ultrasound scan and you or Doppler scan, you find it hypervascular. This is this is not a good sign. Bowel obstruction or bowel stenosis, not a good sign. Ureteric obstruction, ureteric stenosis, these are not good signs. So you guide the lady. She can say yes, she can say no, this is her own decision, but your guidance, you will guide her in that pathway saying, Madam, as Ahmed has just said, these are the options. This is what we would suggest for you. And this would be the best option for you, if that makes sense. Uh, Dr. Gabriel, uh, you had a raised hand, please. Yes, uh, just a comment. You said regard uh, the suspicious uh, mess. I would like just to, to say that uh, you can see a mess between the rectum and the vagina, okay? So it's not necessarily it is endometrioma, but sometimes, as Professor Mabruk said, may be suspicious mess. It may be a rectal mess, not necessarily. Not every mess in the rectovaginal septum would be endometriosis. It's subject for, for differential diagnosis. And do not only use one eye to see the whole picture. Look by two pictures. You have to do BR, 
for any mass suspected. Okay, of course, after taking permission and, the, and the, from the woman. But if you see a mass and this mass is irregular, this mass is hypervascular. Okay, together with symptoms or with rectal symptoms from the patient. Okay, and when you do PR and you think. Uh, this may not be intimate There is no other lesions in the pelvis apart from this lesion. So you may prefer not to operate on this patient by yourself. You may would like to involve a rectal surgeon in the in in uh, in the uh, uh, treatment. And I don't know whether Professor Mabruk agree on this or not because he is very skillful than me in in No, 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 no. Uh, Ahmed, did you have any comments? Yes, it's a very important point that you, you need to uh, think out of the box. You don't you don't have to be minded by endometriosis in every single lesion that you find in the pelvis. And you have to exclude other uh, serious uh, pathologies, for example, like rectal uh, malignancies or uh, any other pathologies by doing a clinical examination. And if you need any other uh, imaging modalities to help you to reach uh, an accurate diagnosis, I think this will be very helpful. Amazing. <clears throat> I also would comment uh, quickly that uh, what uh, Professor Gabriel has just uh, mentioned is extremely important. It, we, we are not technicians, we are clinicians. So it is not that we uh, do an ultrasound scan and we make a decision. It's listening to the patient, understanding her symptoms, clinical examination, if needed, PR examination and bimanual examination, et cetera. Uh, the problem here with these things is that we do not see them. It's not that we see them and we, the, the problem, Ahmed, also that you have to, I think you have highlighted, but I would like to highlight more and more, is that usually we don't see and eyes do not see what mine does not know. Or we do an ultrasound scan and we are reassured, falsely reassured, and we ignore the patient's symptoms. Or we operate without having full image. And this is, I think, one of the points that Dr. Gabriel was also highlighting, is in the doubt, do something else. Do an MRI. If you have a doubt, do an MRI. And uh, uh, the important bit is, yes, with, uh, with uh, a quick, uh, 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 I, I personally, it took me something like seven years to be able to do uh, an ultrasound scan and be confident in the ultrasound scan that I do to the point that I take a patient to theater based on the ultrasound. And now, after uh, almost 20 years treating almost exclusively with endometriosis, uh, I, I, I doubt my ultrasounds and I say, no, please do an MRI. <laughs> because the more you go, the more you find, and this is a question that I will ask you now, uh, but after asking uh, the questions of the colleagues. So here I have uh, some nice, very nice comments for you, greetings and congratulations, and uh, a lot of uh, very positive comments. So they ask you about the ultrasound mapping of surgery. How do you do it using the, uh, which classification? Is it the NCN or whatever, uh, the classification that you utilize? Um, actually, in, the, uh, in our practice, we do not depend on uh, any of these classifications. We just write a, a, a detailed uh, descriptive ultrasound scan uh, and to know uh, uh, where, where, uh, where, uh, what is our target in this patient, either a posterior compartment endometriosis, a tear compartment, and we confirm our diagnosis as a routine by MRI. And uh, after discussing the patient, uh, discussing with the patient the options of treatment, we will proceed either to go, to go, for example, for IVF or to go for surgery. But actually, we do not depend on the insane classification in uh, categorizing our patients. So may I just suggest you one thing, Ahmed? Yes. What Hind is suggesting is very good, and the, most of the centers now are adopting this to utilize the ensign classification in preoperative assessment and to implement it with the ultrasound and with the MRI so that you have also a sort of a parameter for comparison between the different methods and the findings, et cetera, et cetera. And so that we all speak the same language. Yes. So it is, it is very interesting. And uh, thank you for your reply. So I can see here also that uh, Yes, uh, there is a nice question from Ibrahim about the role of ultrasound in follow-up. Do you use ultrasound scan for follow-ups as well? Yes, we follow up the patients by an ultrasound scan. 
uh, and we correlate the, the patient's uh, uh, symptoms after surgery with the ultrasound scan. And sometimes we can find the recurrence of adhesions, uh, although the patient's symptoms can uh, improve uh, significantly. Uh, but we actually routinely scan the patients for follow-up to check for any recurrence of any lesions or any change in the patient's uh, preoperative sonographic picture. Uh, may I also add just one? I'm sorry, Ahmed, I'm just adding because yes, I, uh, I, I feel apologies. It's, a very... it, it's just also one thing that uh, I think I'm sure you highlighted it and I have seen you highlighting it, but it's just uh, in the ultrasound scan in follow-up postoperatively is also important in early diagnosis of any kidney problem. So yes. a scan in the vagina and a scan and a probe a uh, probe in the vagina and a probe on the kidneys because sometimes after your surgery, you do a perfect surgery, a perfect one. But a little bit of fibrosis around the ureter causes obstruction and then and then and then. And if you discover it early, you 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 manage the problem. Tamiri, have your hand raised, please. Thank you, Dr. Mabruk. Uh, just uh, a question about the follow-up you just mentioned. Uh, what is the frequency of the follow-up uh, after one month, three months, or uh, when, when, when the schedule for follow-up after surgery? Or if the patient is not candid for surgery, uh, what's the follow-up regimen in order to avoid any um, uh, silent complication may happen, like the kidney problems or whatever? Uh, actually, we um, uh, agreed, our M MDT uh, and the university hospital, that we will follow up the patient after uh, three months, then six months, then annually. According this, uh, this is our regimen. I, I, I don't think that this is a based on uh, any um, uh, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, practice or any uh, publications, but um, we agreed that we will follow the patient after three months, six months, and then annually after surgery. Okay, and the other question Ahmed was about also the follow-up. If you don't operate the patient, how frequent would you follow her up? So actually what you're saying in post-operative follow-up is the same regimen that's used by most of the international individual centers. We use it and everyone does. Uh, and it is in the database of the accreditations for the individual users, the centers, etc., etc. So the post-operative follow-up, fantastic. How often would you uh, follow up a patient that you decide not to operate on her and you want to follow her up. Yeah. Okay, now, yes, please. Yes, sure. If you want to add any comment to Dr. Mapro before. No, no, please, please, please. Okay. So if the patients, uh, for example, we uh, we decided after this discussion with the patient that the patient will uh, go for medical treatment, for example, um, we give a chance for the medical treatment at least six months before uh, deciding any improvement or any uh, efficacy of the medical treatment or any uh, uh, to, to check for the satisfaction of the patient after treatment at least six months after uh, giving, for example, progesterone or any hormonal treatment before um, uh, evaluating the effects of this treatment. Uh, Dr. Tarek Al-Hawari, here you have your hand raised, please, if you have a question. Dr. Tarq al -Hawal. Okay. Dr. Ibrahim Farid has a question, another question saying, does post-operative fibrosis could affect the ultrasound follow-up images? I think, yeah, yes. The question, Ahmadi, is if the post-operative fibrosis can affect or you can see it in the post-operative ultrasound or something like this. Yes, it can, it, can, it can be seen that uh, uh, negative, it, it, several patients that we have oper operated and underwent, for example, segmented rectal resection for deep um, uh, rectal uh, endometriosis, uh, we, fi we find that there's adhesions between the rectum and the back of the uterus, although there's no any definite uh, rectal endometriosis. So I think, yes, post-operative fibrosis can be seen by ultrasound. IT team, can you please unmute Dr. Tariq Al-Hawari, who has a comment or he wants to say something? So, Dr. Gibril, do you have any comments so far? I mean, we are about to conclude. If we can uh, 
wrap up and see uh, uh, yes in a nutshell if you have any comment or any thing that you want to add I think uh, what uh, Professor Ahmad Khalid Dr. Tariq you can speak yes thank you thank you Mabrook uh, thank you Ahmad for this nice presentation I would like to ask about nerve interrumbent in cases of endometriosis have you seen any case with ultrasound that you can uh, diagnose it, uh, that she has a chronic pelvic pain and sometimes she has nerve interrupt? No, actually, I didn't. Uh, uh, I don't know actually if this can number of sound to diagnose nerve interrupt. And I didn't know uh, any patient before, but just the ultrasound scan that the patient's having any nerve entrapment. So I don't know, actually. I think it's... Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you. Uh, Thank or you. to uh, uh, confirm that this patient's complaining of nerve entrapment. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. I ask it because I, I, I worked for about uh, more than 20 years, and I worked with Marco Bosobo for two years in uh, Hina, and last I have Berbiniology. And so we diagnose cases sometimes uh, with nerve entrapment, with endometriosis, and we should do with laparoscopy to dissect these nerves and to relieve this uh, entrapment. Sometimes with veins, sometimes not endometriosis, sometimes veins compressing the nerves in endometriosis, and they need uh, endoscopic surgery to release this nerve. Thank you. I think this the would be, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Hello? Can you hear me, guys? Hello? Yes. Yes. Hello. Okay. So just a comment about uh, what the colleague has just said. Yes, uh, uh, nerve entrapment is something that happens. Nerve entrapment is extremely difficult to be diagnosed by ultrasound. It can be diagnosed by MRI, but more importantly, clinically. Nerve entrapment is not something that you can explore and just navigate and uh, work around it. It's something that few people in the whole world are um, having the experience and the knowledge to do it. And uh, for Ashan Khatar Rabbina, please don't touch this. Don't don't explore, don't go to uh, explore the nerves, etc. because the damage that you can do with your surgery, unfortunately, many times is irreversible. And uh, if you have some case that you suspect it clinically or by whatever, refer her to someone of uh, the few people in the whole world that do this. Uh, okay, let's come back to the wrapping up and uh, uh, because we need to summarize. Dr. Gabriel, you were saying something? No, no, just would like to thank Professor Ahmad Khalifa for this very, very nice educational uh, presentation. And just to say that what he has uh, said today has uh, definitely cleared up the vision of all our attendees as regards chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia, and some people with unexplained infertility who definitely has not had laparoscopy, but you can suspect that they have endometriosis by doing this detailed ultrasound scan. Thank you very much, Professor Khalifa, really, for what you have just uh, let us learn from me. It's a, real, it's a real pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed, uh, and thanks to Dr. Gabriel. Anyone else, any other comments? Okay, uh, so may I just conclude, Ahmed, if you allow me to? Yes, sure, doctor. By saying that the Journal Club is working and working well, I'm happy for the uh, collaboration of the colleagues and the interaction and the questions that they're asking and the interest. I'm very grateful to you for uh, the time that you spent in preparing this presentation and the excellent comprehensive talk that you did. Uh, I just would like to say that even if we didn't uh, have the opportunity to learn ultrasound from you, but obviously in 30 minutes, it's not that we will learn ultrasound scan, but I would like to tell all my colleagues that this is something doable. You can learn it. You can run courses, Ahmed, there in Alexandria and uh, uh, try to uh, spread the knowledge about uh, ultrasound diagnosis of endometriosis. Eyes do not see what mind does not know. But it's also important that uh, if we have a doubt and a clinical doubt and we don't see, we need time. We need time to learn this. This is not an easy skill. This is not something that you just put the probe and say, Mama, you have uh, endometriosis of the rectal septum, let's do a surgery for you. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that by 
teaching and spreading the knowledge, we will arrive to a good level of accuracy with our ultrasounds. And uh, by this, I would like to conclude and uh, invite you go all to uh, the next webinar. It's the last, no, it's not a webinar, <laughs> journal club meeting, last Friday of every month. We will uh, keep you informed because I think here we have spoken about uh, decision-making in endometriosis. And I think the next uh, uh, the next uh, journal club can be about something like this, decision-making and endometriosis, and we can make it or a treatment or medical treatment or something like that. Please, please write to the email that Darin has just uh, provided with the topics that you want to discuss, and we're very happy to discuss it. Send her cases and uh, uh, be as interactive as possible. Thank you all. Thanks to Ahmed Khalifa, to... I'm calling by names because we are all friends. To Ahmed Khalifa, to to, to, to uh, Dr. Gabriel, he's more senior than myself. Allah yikhali hadithik. Well, for Tamir Hussain, for Darin, and for Samah, for the whole team, thank you very much, and uh, have a fantastic and wonderful evening, and all the best. Thank you.